So I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily um, Trichu. Um, she is a clinical neuropsychologist with the VA Puget Sound Healthcare Systems Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, or GREC. She's cross-appointed at the University of Washington School of Medicine as an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And she's specialized in neurodegenerative diseases throughout her career, has over 20 years of experience in geriatrics. Her clinical work and research has been focused on the full continuum of cognitive aging from dementia to super aging into the 90s and beyond. Since joining the VA, she's developed an additional and complementary interest in the care of older veterans with PTSD, especially with respect to how this disorder can interfere with cognition and might contribute to decline. And she's going to um, give us an, an update on frontline tools, delirium, dementia, and depression in older adults. Welcome, Dr. Trichu. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to join the group again here today. Um, I there's always a new new times, right? Uh, so we've used technology before, um, but this is a slightly different setup, and I'm giving this for a talk from the guest bedroom of my house. So hopefully, uh, boy, dog, partner, uh, everyone will stay quiet, and we won't have any interruptions. But apologies in advance. Um, I would also say thank you, uh, Dr. Cochran, for playing that lovely music. I think I'm going to have his haunting voice in my, in my head as I give the talk here today. It's a little inspiring, I think. Um, so again, as you said, the title for today is Frontline Tools, Dimension, sorry, Delirium, Dementia, and Depression in Older Adults. Let's see if I can forward this properly. Uh, I want to give proper disclosures here. I have nothing to disclose, um, but importantly, the views and opinions in this presentation are mine, um, and they should not be uh, taken as the official policy or as reflecting that of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs or the University of Washington. For anyone that's also so able to see the video of me, I'll let you know, I actually have my presenter's notes up on a different monitor um, from what you're seeing. So if I'm looking kind of up and away, that's the reason. So our learning objectives for today, uh, I've got a couple, but the main ones are to characterize, um, hopefully that by the end of this, you will feel confident that you can characterize dementia, delirium, and depression. And that you'll actually be able to identify the really important key similarities and differences between the clinical syndromes. That you'll recognize warning signs and feel confident initiating some sort of aspects or all of a diagnostic workup. And then utilize, think about how you might utilize that data to guide treatment and consider care planning. And this is really, when I say care planning, I wanna be clear that that isn't us always telling our patients what they should do or their loved ones what they should do, but then with our data, sharing it with the patient, getting their feedback about what's important to them to really consider this um, patient-centered model um, and, and adapt our recommendations um, to fit what is important for our patients. So why is this clinically relevant? If you're tuned in, you probably really don't need a lot of this information, but let me share it again now. I think it's important to know that this year, our oldest baby boomers are actually already turning age 74. By 2029, all of the baby boomers are gonna be at least 65 years old. And that number of Americans overall over age 65 is expected to grow, grow almost exponentially. And importantly, our older adults constitute some pretty significant pieces here. 26% um, of physician outpatient office visits, a third of all hospital stays and of all prescriptions, almost 40% of emergency medical responses, and a little less surprisingly, about 90% of those who are residing in uh, nursing full care facilities. So I pulled this from the, uh, uh, as a publication of the US Census Bureau. And basically, figure one shows trends uh, with overall greater numbers um, as older adults are aging. Um, and you can see that that pattern is slightly higher for, uh, for women. Um, there are more older adult women. Um, and that's going to possibly even become more pronounced by the year 2050. I think what's also interesting, and I'm not sure I can really do my mouse to show this if you're all able to see my cursor, 
Um, but you can see that there's this bulge, 2010 is here, and 2030 up higher aged, um, as that baby boomer uh, group is shifting upward. Um, and it really does hold its relative shape until about that 20 to 40, 2040, 2050 period, um, which is sort of when folks are hitting um, life expectancy. Next, a figure two is actually probably the more important figure that I'm going to show you. And that's where we highlight um, the dependency ratios uh, versus young versus older adults. Um, you can see that the youth life, uh, I'm sorry, dependencies are expected to hold steady, while those for older adults have been edging upward, um, pretty much reaching its zenith in 2030, and then expected to hold a bit steady through 2050. I will say there's a caveat here. These are projections that are based on the 2010 census data. Um, we have to wonder what's going to happen with the 2020 census data that is trying to be collected right now. Will it result in reliable data? Will the census be suspended? We don't know. It's possible that the current pandemic is going to cause a visible shift in these numbers and these trends. However, regardless, um, it's not going to change the likelihood of increasing numbers of older adults who need health care and also likely support in their daily living functions. This is an older slide I have um, based on the 2000 census. I liked it because um, it actually broke things down by state. I know we've got a group of folks here from the Pacific Northwest, maybe even some people from Alaska. And you can see these projections. I highlight the uh, Washington numbers here. Uh, you can see that there's pretty much a doubling from 2010 to 2030. Um, I would note that the 2010 census for Washington uh, for age 65 plus actually had a number of over 827,000. So um, you can see that that was an underestimate from the 20, uh, 2000 census already. Okay, why we're here though. How to provide care for this increasing and changing demographic. I would say that if we think it's going to be covered by geriatric specialists, um, that's just not going to happen. There's always a need for folks across healthcare disciplines to develop interest and specialization in geriatrics, but it's not going to meet the need. It's really not going to meet it by a long shot. Could this all be covered by primary care providers? Well, I think it's evident they're going to carry much of the load, but think about the sheer numbers and the time limits that are in place for their encounters. They can't meet the need either. Really, it's going to come down to a fully patient-aligned care team uh, that will be made up of folks um, of a, from an interprofessional team, um, and I would argue that a packed team is where it's at. By the time my talk is done, I think that you will hopefully agree with me that given the significant consequences of untreated, and once I talk about them, delirium, depression, and dementia, that we'll have to have a paradigm shift such that these disorders are just a regular part of every workup um, and the diagnostic differential for all of our older adults. And I always come back to, I mean, maybe it's because I'm a psychologist, but a team approach is best. I work in an interprofessional interdisciplinary group, um, and I just can't imagine um, not having the resources that uh, my team provides um, and that I hope they feel I can provide to them as well. So back to the three Ds here. What might you hear in clinic? I'm going to give you some things that you might hear um, either in clinic or maybe these days on the phone with patients and loved ones. Things like, I can't focus or she's not interested in her usual activities. I can't come up with the word I want. My energy is low. I, I always love, I get this one actually far more than you would expect, but my husband, his selective attention is worse. He doesn't listen to me. Uh, my short-term memory is shot. I couldn't find my car in the parking lot, although I have to say, if anyone's ever seen the Seattle VA's parking lot, that's actually pretty understandable. It all looks the same and it's huge. Um, or maybe someone's complaining, you know, you, you didn't tell me to change my medications. So I think what's interesting is that all of these signs um, or these comments are sort of red flags, aren't they? It's very good to recognize that. However, does it tell you whether they're suffering from depression, delirium, or dementia? It doesn't, unfortunately. These are pretty common concerns and they're not specific to any one of the three Ds. 
Now, before I jump in more about the three Ds and especially the cognitive symptoms that you might um, either observe or hear about, I think it's really useful to remind ourselves that there, is, there are some changes in thinking that are pretty typical in cognitive aging. Uh, you'll notice I use the word typical and I even put it in quotes. I don't really like to use the word normal because it implies that cognitive aging is pretty ubiquitous across individuals. That's really not the case. There's a lot of heterogeneity that's associated with increasing age. Um, and it's also very subjective to say that something is normal or abnormal. So what is typical of cognitive aging is that individuals have well-preserved autobiographical memory. They know stuff about themselves and their lives and what they do. They have a recall of well-learned information. Having learned at some point that Paris is the capital of France, people don't typically lose that knowledge base. They also don't typically lose their procedural memory, knowing how to do things, how to drive a car, how to make scrambled eggs, all sorts of things like that. Um, and additionally, emotional processing actually typically remains relatively steady across one's lifespan. Now, for some people, typical might be lots of ups and downs, uh, while for others, they're, you know, steady eddy. But just um, note that if someone's in their late 60s, 70s, or 80s, and their emotional regulation and processing seems to change, that's meaningful. It's worth paying attention to. Things that do often change as one grows older um, is uh, ability to encode new information. Um, folks can sometimes be slower to learn new tasks. They may need a little bit more repetition or, or things given to them in smaller chunks at a time. That kind of links in with this working memory piece. Um, multitasking, you know, these teenagers, they somehow seem to be able to do five things at once. They're on the phone, they're on the computer, they're supposedly doing their homework. Um, that's not really typically the case for most of us. Um, this is a skill that can start to show some areas of decline um, in one's 40s, 50s, uh, fairly young. Um, however, I would add, most older adults um, are better at recognizing what's important and critical and will often focus on those things first, not needing to multitask five things at once. Uh, one thing that does seem to be fairly ubiquitous is processing speed. Uh, that reaction time, whether it's a mental reaction time or a physical, does seem to change um, as one gets older. And that one, if you look at the curves, actually starts its very slow, subtle decline um, even as early as in one's 20s. So let's just review. I know that Stephen Fielke actually gave his presentation last week, um, so hopefully you were able to tune into that. And he probably covered this, but I'll just reiterate now because it's important. Dementia is a decline in some aspect of cognitive function and or behavior. And it has to hit these four important markers. It needs to be significant. It has to be at a level that is actually having functional consequences. The change needs to be chronic. There's usually an insidious onset and a progressive course. This is not something that gets better, that someone is really totally back to their normal selves for weeks on end, and then they show a drop again, and then they're back up again. It's usually insidious onset and progressive. Really quickly with that insidious onset comment, I will say though, family members do often have a, a, a seminal event that they might point to. Um, having loved ones over for Christmas and their loved one not remembering the names of family members that they should remember the names for. So sometimes they time lock their uh, sense of when things started to events, but usually if you ask more, there'll be little clues earlier on. And next one, loss. These need to be new impairments. They can't be lifelong weaknesses. There are plenty of people who are, say, never good with arithmetic, um, and they're not gonna get better with it in their 70s or 80s. Or, for instance, I work with veterans. A number of veterans have had head injuries while in the service or afterward, and they had a drop in some functional ability and in their cognitive abilities. I then need to evaluate them from that new baseline, not, um, uh, see this and, and judge that as the cause or the, the factor for dementia. 
And importantly, when someone has dementia, a neurodegenerative disease, there's structural damage going on in the brain. There's either the buildup of pathologies in the brain, such as we might see with Alzheimer's disease, or there's vascular changes happening, and eventually neurons, those workhorses of the brain, are dying. What is dementia not? It is not a delirium. There is not usually an acute onset. Um, attention and concentration problems are not usually the very first and most critical and solo symptoms. It's definitely not depression, uh, apathy, being distracted. Um, often when I see folks for a full neuropsychological evaluation who turn out to be depressed and not have dementia, they actually test really well. Um, in fact, sometimes it's like they kind of bolster up their energy um, and they're kind of excited on some inner level to be engaging and not isolated and, and thinking only about their negative feelings. Um, and so trying to tease that out ahead of time can sometimes avoid them needing to go through uh, multiple hours of testing with me. Dementia is definitely not sensory deficits or communication problems. Uh, similar to what I mentioned before, you know, if someone had a stroke many years ago and they've had some um, language communication problems, that's probably a deficit that's gonna last with them for quite a while. So you have to be sure that your method for talking to them and getting a sense of their thinking abilities is skirting around that more longstanding issue. Dementia is definitely not normal aging. I'm happy no one seems to think that anymore. Uh, when I first started in training in graduate school many decades ago, that was kind of a common um, belief among general lay people and even among um, some primary care providers that if you live long enough, you know, if you're in your 80s, well, you're definitely not going to be able to remember new things. That's normal. I mean, it really is not. We see folks into their 90s and 100s who are really sharp. There are many types of dementia, and I'm pretty sure Stephen, my colleague, Phil, uh, recovered some of these. Um, I did want to just highlight a handful of them. I, uh, if I had an audience here, I'd ask you to raise your hands or call out which one you think is the most common cause of dementia. Uh, typically, in most populations, that is Alzheimer's disease as the cause of a dementia. Um, but vascular causes, cerebrovascular disease is right up there next to it, and even the most common cause in some populations. Lewy body disease is a fairly common cause of dementia in older adults. I've added in these last two because I think it's important to know that Parkinson's disease is fairly common and it's increasingly common with age. And a lot of times we just think about that as being a motor disorder. Um, unfortunately, for those that have Parkinson's disease who've had it for a while and are older, about 50% of those folks will develop a cognitively, you know, symptom based dementia syndrome. And so being on the lookout for that is important. Also, frontotemporal dementia, I list it here, it's not very common. Um, however, because there's often a behavioral component um, and psychiatric symptoms and um, uh, mood symptoms, it can sometimes come to our attention and look like it might be a, a, a psychiatric disorder, maybe depression or bipolar disorder, things like that. So there's many different things that can um, seem like dementia. Hold on one second, I'm gonna to try to move something out of the way here. Okay, um, these often fall into categories like being toxic metabolic factors, systemic illnesses, there's others, I guess that's kind of a grab bag uh, uh, category that I created there. Um, but you can see here some of the things that I've highlighted that I would say that you should jump and to look out for. Under the toxic metabolic, we always want to think about polypharmacy in our older adults. I know there's really new emphasis on de-prescribing, um, but it is still a new emphasis. It's so common that I see patients who throughout their years have developed new conditions and they get put on medications for it. They go into one doctor with certain concerns that seem relevant to that problem and their doctor gives them something to help them sleep. And then they go into another doctor and that doctor gives them something to help them be more alert in the morning um, or something for pain. And you can see how these can add up. Many times prescribers are hesitant to, to remove or de-prescribe a medication that another MD has prescribed. And so sometimes it's really good when you get a new patient to take a good look at the big picture 
and think about what they're on. Um, if you have a pharmacist you can consult with, that's a great place to start. So many medications have contraindications um, with other medications or specifically for older adults in general. Uh, let's see, what else do I have listed up here? You can read a bunch of these. Um, just even severe pulmonary disease or cardiovascular disease can cause challenges for blood flow to the brain, oxygen to the brain. Um, and then in that other category, I just put in a couple of the, the quote unquote favorites that I come across, um, depression, PTSD, causing symptoms and or looking like a dementia process. Sleep apnea is a very tricky one. It has high, high prevalence in our older adults, especially men. Um, and if you think about it, sort of that chronic sleep deprivation or chronic poor quality sleep can definitely lead to cognitive challenges. So I think a thing to highlight here is that we're always on the lookout for things that could be mimicking dementia, could be causing cognitive impairment and wanting to treat them. Um, however, I wanna emphasize that treatment may improve but may not fully reverse the symptoms. And that's why monitoring folks over time is so important. All right, moving on. What delirium is? Well, uh, my gosh, back when I started in training, there were so many different names for delirium. We always talked about in the neurology world, toxic metabolic encephalopathy, um, or um, in other clinics, it would be the acute confusional state. I do think that um, it's great that there's a, bit, a little bit more um, simplicity now and that most folks will use delirium um, and not necessarily be interchanging these other more, I'll argue, confusing terms. I think what's really important here is that delirium is a medical condition, typically has a fairly rapid acute onset. Now I do want to emphasize for some individuals that can be over days, maybe even a week or two, while for others the onset can be within an hour, especially if they're in a hospital setting. Uh, typically, it's characterized by deficits in attention and concentration, and there's often this waxing and waning of mental status. Um, folks seem much more alert at certain times, and even just an hour later can seem very confused um, and not know where they are. These uh, lists here are the infections, medications, metabolic abnormalities. Those are the most common causes. Interestingly, in our older adults, and even more so, especially in those who already have some areas of weakness in their thinking, the mental status changes will often precede any objective signs of illness. So um, imagine an older um, female patient who um, is very, very confused and it, it becomes maybe belligerent. Um, she may not yet have really noticed symptoms of a ur urinary tract infection. And so that may sort of come up afterward, but unfortunately she may already be in the confusional state. So it's kind of up to us to recognize these things and think outside the box, not send someone off directly to a psychiatrist, but rather to do that medical workup immediately to try to pick up on any objective signs of infection or other problems that can be treated. I say this because time and time again, this is an older study by NUA and colleagues from 2001, but frankly every delirium study that's been done um, has suggested that it is typically under-recognized, especially in sort of these frontline clinics what delirium is not. It's not insignificant. Again, multitude of studies are showing that there is increased mortality when you follow individuals who are experiencing mortality. And that's over the next six months, even up to two years, this increased mortality and morbidity is seen. Um, delirium is definitely not a dementia. As I mentioned, dementia is typically a slower onset, slower decline, and much more subtle fluctuations. Delirium is not rapidly resolving even when you catch the cause. So remember how I mentioned that the mental status changes will precede objective illness signs sometimes? In the same um, manner, you'll see, say, that someone's uh, white cell counts or whatever objective signs you have of infection or other problem are clear, they may still be mentally clouded. Um, and for anyone working in um, urgent care or a hospital setting, you wanna really have um, done education with loved ones, uh, make sure you're not discharging them home alone where no one would be able to help them because their thinking may not be back fully online. 
I typically will not do a, neuropsycholo a neuropsychological evaluation with a goal of diagnosis. Say if someone says, oh, does this person have dementia? If they've been in the hospital and they've had a delirium, I will do everything I can to wait at least three months until after they've been discharged and back in their normal environment so that there's a chance their cognition will have cleared as fully as possible. And it's definitely not normal aging. I think that one goes without saying. So there are many risk factors for delirium. I've definitely said the word hospitalization so far, and that is one of the biggest one. For older adults who are hospitalized, delirium affects up to 40%. A lovely um, review and meta-analysis was done uh, a handful of years ago. And when they do their pooled analysis to look at risk factors, they saw that already having dementia, the more severe the illness, folks who had visual impairments, maybe a urinary catheterization, even very concrete objective things like having low albumin, and then additionally a longer hospital stay, these were all found to be significantly higher and important risk factors for predicting delirium. Uh, additionally, um, I, did a, I pulled this one study because I thought it was particularly interesting. It looked only at a hip fracture hospital sample, and it had a very large end. So it had over 550 folks. Out of those folks, 35% had a delirium while they were in the hospital for this hip fracture. And you can see here that some similar but a few unique risk factors came up for being the folks that had the delirium age. So this was a, a across a broad age range. And so with increasing age, that was a risk factor. Having dementia, again, having a history of delirium. Unfortunately, once you have a delirium once, your risk of getting it again at some point with an additional health problem, a, a, a flu even, um, is higher than it would be if you had never experienced one. And then you can see a couple of the other um, uh, risk factors here. So how do we recognize delirium? I, I'm reinforcing, I'm saying a lot of these things over and over again just to drive them home. It's a confusion that typically develops over days, maybe weeks, sometimes hours, depending on the situation. Folks have trouble with concentration, focus, attention. It's often a waxing and waning course. They actually have very typically um, fluctuating sleep and sleep disturbance. I wanna highlight this next bullet point. Folks can sometimes present as hyperactive, very agitated. This is that patient you imagine in a hospital who's very confused and trying to pull out their lines, um, trying to um, get out of their room at night, disturbing other patients. Um, we sort of often, at least I do, think of that one as the more prototypical person with delirium. However, there is another type where sometimes people will be hypoactive and seem sedated. This one I think is a dangerous one because these people don't get recognized right away. Um, I have definitely had a patient before who had uh, an early stage dementia diagnosis who was pretty irritating for their loved one because of their repetitive questioning and a little bit of agitation. Um, and the wife was really beside herself uh, after I talked with her after a hospitalization because when her husband was first just really quiet and sitting in the chair all the time and kind of dozing out and in, um, she was kind of felt relief because he wasn't pestering her. Um, and so she felt a great amount of guilt later when she realized that he had actually developed an infectious process um, and ended up being hospitalized in the ICU for a while. So be on the lookout for these things as we can help um, the folks that we work with. I mentioned here erratic, uncharacteristic, inappropriate behavior. Um, oftentimes folks will have hallucinations, um, often visual, that may be accompanied by paranoia, maybe some delusional thinking. Um, and I mentioned the somnolence, it kind of goes with the hypoactive state. I did pull this. Um, there was a headline last week um, from the New York Times about how some coronavirus patients may be showing signs of brain ailments. That was the title of the article, so you can look it up if you would like. It was a really short article, but basically it highlighted that a bunch of doctors um, have been observing some neurological symptoms, things like confusion, so delirium, and even stroke and seizures in a small subset of these COVID-19 patients. It did seem to be occurring more often in older um, patients. Um, and so we should always be on the lookout for that higher delirium risk. I also would argue we don't know where these folks are going to be in three, six, you know, 12 months post um, suffering from the illness. So I think it would be important to do some ongoing monitoring for depression and dementia. Um, there could be survivor guilt if you think about depression, 
maybe adjustment to new psychosocial changes, maybe they've had losses, physical losses, there's so many reasons. So switching then to depression, as I was starting to talk about, um, I've listed here just a syndrome, a bunch of the um, symptoms, um, complaints, concerns that someone who's suffering from depression might be experiencing. It's often a combination of psychological and bodily symptoms. Um, people may be um, complaining of increased pain in, addi in addition to some of these other things. There may not be an actual source of increased pain. Rather, their mood is low and they are focusing more on negative things. Depression is definitely not a bad day, a bad week, or a month. We all have those. And it's not grief. Um, if someone has a significant loss or even an insignificant loss, they may experience grief from that. Um, and therefore, we have to remember it's not um, the syndrome of depression needs to be disentangled from a natural reaction, say, to a new medical illness that's been diagnosed or uh, going through something or that loss. Um, importantly, though, depression is not a cause of dementia. There was a term that used to be used called pseudo-dementia to suggest that someone who is in a more vegetative and severe depression had pseudo-dementia. I don't hear that as much anymore. I dislike the term. First of all, there's nothing pseudo about dementia, and also there's nothing pseudo about depression. I think it minimalize, um, it's a little possibly pejorative if you ask me. My most important bullet point is this last one. Depression is not untreatable in older adults, so I'm gonna come back around to that in a moment. How do we recognize depression? I kind of hinted at this. Sometimes it presents as non-specific physical symptoms, increased fatigue, increased sense of pain, maybe GI problems, right? Um, I do think that while this is changing, older adults are sometimes less likely than younger adults to admit to being depressed. Um, I have that in air quotes there, or not air quotes, but I'm doing the air quotes now, but it's in quotes on the slide. Um, sometimes I use different words. You know, you don't have to always say depression. Um, if someone says, oh no, I'm not depressed. Okay, well, do you have times where you're feeling down, feeling blue, feeling not like yourself? Um, we want to try to find different ways to communicate with people so that we can find a language, um, semantics that will resonate for them if those symptoms are present. I would say that um, patients are sometimes more willing to endorse mental health symptoms in writing than in person. Um, also consider if you're asking about those symptoms and they have loved ones in the room, they may be less likely to be forthcoming. So I personally try to ask about symptoms of depression more than once during the time that I'm working with someone and in more than one manner. So depression in older adults, as many as 10% of adults over age 65 who are seen just in primary settings, primary care settings, um, actually meet criteria for clinically significant depression. Uh, younger and older adults respond equally well to treatment. Many studies have supported this, psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy. And in fact, there's many studies that suggest that a combination therapy is um, often most effective. Unfortunately, only about 10% of older adults with depression are actually receiving active treatment. Um, so we want to be on a lookout for this. The study did not, um, was not able to answer all the questions of why only 10% were getting treatment. Um, there may be some folks who are not interested in treatment, but I would say just because someone, say, refuses treatment or um, suggestions for therapy or pharmacotherapy initially, you still should bring it up again. Right? A lot of times, I don't know, I'm trying to think of my son, you know, he certainly didn't want to try broccoli the first time he saw it, um, but after trying it a couple times, he loves it and he knows it makes him feel better and builds a, a stronger body. So sometimes we have to come back around to things, especially if we see them as being clinically significant for our patients. Um, respecting their input and their wishes, of course, but not just taking no once as a final answer. I think um, particularly important for me, but really important for all of us, um, and um, especially in areas where folks don't have as easy access to mental health care, we have to think about suicide rates. Across the board, they're higher in older adults. Um, additionally, there's additional risk factors of being a veteran, being male, um, and additionally in uh, both whites and in Native Americans. So we always want to be on the lookout. 
I think it's also important if you come across a new onset uh, depression in an older adult to even once you get treatment going or they agree to treatment or however it goes for their depression, that you actually do monitor them for cognitive change. There have been studies, uh, this is not the only one, I just highlighted one here. There've been a number of studies that have suggested that that new onset depression in later life can actually be a red flag and or symptom for preclinical dementia. So I totally stole the original format of this from Stephen Fielke, um, but it's really just to highlight some of the common features across dementia, delirium, and depression. Um, then also some of the things that are actually hallmarks and a little bit more specific to them. And so I believe you all um, will have access to these slides as a PDF and you can use this as it, if it's helpful. So there's often an overlap in symptoms. Rates of depression and dementia range actually all the way up to 86% of cases. Um, it's not uncommon that folks um, uh, who have dementia can end up with delirium superimposed on their dementia. Um, in a study, uh, by again, by Inuit and colleagues, they looked at older hospitalized patients, uh, this case over age 70, and they looked at the co-occurrence, not of dementia, but of delirium and depression. And they found that those who had the overlap syndrome had much higher odds of having one month functional decline, and unfortunately, additionally, higher odds of nursing home placement and or death, sorry, or death at one year out. So I'd like to kind of just pull up a case here. Um, it's sort of an adaptation of, of, of patients I've seen, and, or maybe one in particular. We're going to talk about Joseph. He's a 66-year-old male veteran. He's been divorced for a couple years from his second wife, and I just highlighted that, that was a less than five-year marriage, so she um, wasn't, they weren't together for a very long amount of time. He's new to your primary care clinic, and he moved here to be closer to his daughter. He's living independently in an apartment, and his daughter is kind of the one who, who dragged him in. Uh, she basically is like, look, he just sits around all day and he forgets what I tell him. I tell him I'm coming over on Friday and he's a surprise when I show up. Um, and in fact, when you ask him what's wrong, his response is pretty much, well, I'm fine. So he's coming in just to because she wants him to. He has um, some premorbid history, diabetes, hypertension. Uh, according to the veteran and his daughter, as far as they both know, they've uh, historically been under good control. So here's kind of just this little highlight here. So interestingly, that premorbid history of diabetes and hypertension, they're reporting good control. But when you check the blood pressure and glucose, they're, all, they're both quite out of range. So one question you might ask yourself, so, sorry, let me back up. Sometimes there could be a knee-jerk reaction of, well, gosh, you know, his, blood, his uh, hypertensive medications must not be working. He, maybe he's not eating very well, or maybe he needs to go on insulin. Um, but I would say that it's really important to first ask yourself, is he taking his medications and insulin as prescribed before adjusting medications? Um, when you ask him a little bit more about what's going on for him, he shares that he's missing his ex-wife and that he doesn't have any friends here. And you're very observant and you notice that he is not seeming particularly cognitively sharp and he's definitely seeming disengaged at this visit. So you've got the red flags, right? Um, definitely, yes. Um, but do you know if it's depression? Or is it dementia or is it delirium? No, you don't. Um, but now hopefully you definitely know not to, or you already did, not to jump to conclusions or simply change his medications and then send him home. So what might be the next steps? I would argue, and so in many, it's time to initiate a workup. And that makes me want to um, think about, well, what are my screening measures? How can I try to put some numbers on this? How can I check the criteria for different things? And toward that end, I am promoting something which I get nothing from financially. Um, it's a government uh, produced document, so it's free um, and available to anyone. Uh, it's a 3Ds assessment guide to geriatric dementia, delirium, and depression. The current version that we have in print um, from our VA uh, Geriatric Research Education Clinical Care Center is from 2014. We're hard at work on the 2020 version, but here's a spoiler alert. Um, we're only making it prettier. There are really no major content changes that are happening. So I have here kind of a, a printout of the two sides of this five um, folded card that fits nicely in a pocket. 
And I'll focus first on the delirium panel. Um, the thing I want to highlight here is that on the left side of the panel, it uh, talks about some of the common symptoms and emphasizes certain things that I've already covered. Um, and then on the right side, it refers to the CAM, the Confusion Assessment Method. It's a diagnostic algorithm. So basically, you can feel pretty confident about diagnosing a delirium if you have the presence of features one and two. So there's that acute onset and fluctuating course and problems with attention. And then also having either three or four, which is a, a sort of a level of disorganized thinking, um, illogical flow of ideas, um, not really being able to answer questions and or that sort of altered level of consciousness. Now, you could probably pick up on it sooner than this um, if you're really alert. So when you're working up delirium, remember, this is not just a bad day. You want to use collateral sources of information um, and consider the whole clinical picture, all the medical things going on for the patient. I have here a pretty brutal acronym um, for the most common um, causes and the, the full range of things that you should look into as possible causes of delirium. Uh, it's I Watch Death. I learned it from medical students way back in the day, and frankly, medical students are pretty morbid, so I thought that this was appropriate, but it certainly catches the attention and reminds us of all that we need to cover. In the case of Joseph, I'm happy to say his workup was negative. Um, he didn't really fit the symptoms uh, and criteria for a delirium. Regardless, he still had some blood work done um, and was shown that other than his um, high glucose, his high A1C that was seen, he was doing fine. So next we think about depression, right? Um, and on that card, there's the PHQ-2. Um, there's so many different um, screeners out there. Um, so obviously you want to go with whatever your facility or clinic um, uses in a pretty, um, it's good to apply it in a regular um, and consistent manner. But if you're not already using something and you're looking for something, the PHQ-2 is pretty nice. Um, it's quick and dirty. You basically ask the person over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by these problems? And it's either little or no interest or pleasure in doing things. So that's essentially getting at anhedonia. Um, or two, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. I personally, in my clinic, Always also directly ask if anyone's had any feelings that life is not worth living or thought about harming themselves. Um, so you would look at this, um, a score of three or greater merits jumping on to what's called the PHQ-9. So the PHQ-9 is also on this Frontline 3Ds card. Um, and you can see here we have those additional, two, those original two questions from the PHQ-2 and seven more questions to get up to nine. And you can see that now this jumps in even more specifically um, with questions about um, some psycho, so, uh, sorry, psychomotor changes, um, and feelings, concentration. Uh, additionally, that last one, thinking that you might be better off dead. So if you get someone with a positive screen, it's incredibly important to either, um, if you're trained in doing this, uh, doing a suicide risk evaluation, or having some method in your clinic whereby you can immediately do that warm handoff to that mental health professional, that trained provider who can do that important assessment. Um, trying to just set someone up or giving them a phone number to call for an outpatient appointment when they've endorsed um, suicidal ideation is it's just really not sufficient, okay? Uh, in this case, in Joseph's case, his workup was positive. However, he was not endorsing, and in fact, he very flatly denied um, experiencing any suicidal ideation. Um, he also endorsed a number of protective risk fact, uh, protective factors and steps spontaneously. He um, shared steps he would take if his mood started feeling worse. Um, one thing, sorry, just thinking about the depression thing with Joseph, you know, it was interesting. He didn't share any of this in front of his daughter. He only shared it later. But when I asked him if he was okay with me bringing it up with his daughter, he was okay. And somehow having me bring it up allowed him to broach the subject with her. And they actually had a communication about his feelings that it was so um, heartwarming. They had never had. Um, and it turns out Joseph had actually experienced some depression at other times in his life, not quite the way it was now, 
Um, and then his daughter shared that she also had had some times where she had been significantly down and not able to kind of get herself going without help. So uh, shifting gears to dementia, the, um, the three D's card has red flags on it, basically what are called the dementia warning signs. These are the signs and symptoms a clinician, caregiver or patient may notice, and they should really prompt any provider to evaluate cognition. And there's a list of items here. I'm not gonna read it all over, um, all of them to you. Um, I'm guessing that Dr. Thielke uh, brought them up and you'll have them in your PDF. I might highlight um, that one of the things I like to add to this is I do ask my patients a little bit about current events. Um, and if they're really unaware of things either that are big news items or, for instance, they forgot that they were attending their daughter's um, 40th birthday party the week before, those to me are red flags as well. So we need screening tools sometimes or, or ways to quickly measure certain aspects of thinking ability to try to see whether uh, and how much is there. Uh, on the card is a screening tool called the MINICOG. Um, and I just want to be uh, emphasized, this is not something that should be used to diagnose dementia, but it's definitely good for catching whether any more follow-up should happen. You want to get your patient's attention and have them try to remember three words. Um, and you ask them to remember them now and later, you say them, and you give folks up to three tries to be able to repeat all three words back to you. And then you're gonna ask them to draw a clock um, and set the hands to a certain time on the clock. And at that point when they're finished, that's when you ask them the three words um, again to see if they can remember those. There's a scoring um, guideline um, with the idea that someone who has a perfect score and suggested of no impairment, um, and I would say, let's see, the clock is an all or none scoring. So I just pulled up here. Um, it's either all or nothing, two or zero. And also if someone, sometimes I wrote something, you get someone who refuses to draw a clock. And that also is considered to be abnormal. I would say here that I have found that there are folks who don't have memory problems. They do just fine on the memory piece, but they draw an abnormal clock. So as you can see here, three to five, quote unquote, suggests no impairment. I, please, 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 if you get someone who draws a really abnormal clock, but even if they get the words right, they probably still need more workup. Um, there are certain types of cognitive illness uh, and dementias that can affect things other than memory uh, first, and we wanna catch that early. There are many other brief cognitive measures. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of the slums. That's the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam. The MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. These are all good 30-point examples. Um, and so I tend to recommend the MOCA. That's not on the card. We want you to go to the website if you want to use it, um, get trained on it, know how to administer it. It is much better than things like the old school uh, mini mental status examination, the MMSE. It's well researched. It has multiple English versions. So say if you are evaluating someone on that inpatient unit and you need to do more than one assessment in the course of a, a week or two as you check on a resolving delirium, you've got those. There's a blind and or telephone version. There's even now as of a, about a week ago, a week and a half ago, a telemedicine version that the authors posted on their website. Uh, I'll reiterate, it's important to do some sort of training or get trained. Um, to, to administer it using proper standardized administration. From the website, you can get very clear-cut instructions um, on how to do it. So why might you wanna use brief cognitive measures? Well, I would argue that it's a really good way to obtain a quick sense of cognitive, uh, of global cognitive function. It can identify if there are glaring deficits. It also can help to follow someone with identified deficits over time. I think there's often a situation where we need to uh, see whether there's a reason to question whether someone has decision-making capacity. 
I've really worked hard to get this to be used regularly on the patients um, who are inpatient on our psychiatric unit. Um, some of them with um, difficult to treat depression are candidates for electroconvulsive therapy. Um, however, we need to make sure that they really understand what they are consenting to if they choose to undergo a procedure like that. And you could imagine that's the case for any type of um, medical decision making. To identify cognitive decline early, um, to pick up on early symptoms, I would say that the benefits here um, include potentially an early introduction of cholinesterase inhibitors if it's a case of dementia. I think most importantly, addressing any reversible influences and also to assist with care planning. And for some situations, um, especially when I end up then seeing someone after they've had a mocha that's in the gray zone, I'll see them and I can actually use these numbers to help motivate them toward positive behavioral change. Uh, for instance, is if a patient has started um, using a lot of cannabis to um, help them with certain medical conditions, unfortunately, it may be having a significant negative impact on their thinking ability. So, I, oh, sorry, I should have said, I've left out an important piece of the puzzle for dementia. There's one more consideration that's very important that's left, and that is function. Uh, and so on that 3Ds card, there's a functional activities questionnaire. Uh, and you can use this to help remind yourself of what are the things that we as independent adults uh, typically have to do to live, to, to do our stuff, to live independently. And so running over these, you use a scoring criteria, and it can help you get a sense of where someone is. I often recommend asking someone, okay, this is what you do now, um, and then getting that collateral to both agree or you know support what the individual said but also to give you a sense of well, what did they used to do um, many of my veterans never prepared a balanced meal item six um, a number of them never took care of the tax records or the bills um, they had spouses or partners that did that because they were the primary breadwinner and they were at work um, and not taking care of a lot of these household tasks that now they need to be in charge of because they're say retired or disabled so always put it in context, I guess, is my, my take home message there. Okay, so we've got all these pieces of the puzzle. Um, let's say our person has that poor cognition, functional activities have changed from their baseline. Um, all the things are there except weight. We always have to remember that dementia is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and we want to think about what risk factors could be causal or contributing at the very least. I put this last, this little note here at the bottom and remember to communicate diagnostic information to your patients. A study was done in 2015 by the, um, written, reported by the Alzheimer's Association that found that only 45% of people who had been given a dementia diagnosis actually knew that they had been given that diagnosis. It was in their chart but it had not been actually communicated to them. Um, and that's in complete contrast to things like a cancer diagnosis, where over 90% have a very clear verbal diagnosis. Their results were communicated to them by their um, provider. So back to my risk factors that I want you to think about. We either wanna manage these or help people avoid them. Uh, you can see the medical conditions here. Joseph has diabetes, he has high blood pressure. I didn't really get into these other behavioral factors for him, but there were a few things there as well. I think it's also important to think that if any of these things are on board, especially to uh, a certain degree, um, we might all test poorly on some of these cognitive screens or brief cognitive tests. If you're running around in a constant state of hypoglycemia or sleep deprived, at least quality sleep deprived for, due to sleep apnea, um, we're going to have poor cognitive function. So what that kind of leads to, what's the meaning of these cognitive screeners or, or short brief measures? I would say that it's important to always think about how to interpret them or pass the interpretation on. You can get the data and then pass it on to a geriatric specialist, someone who knows dementia and other cognitive disorders well. We also want to think about the appropriate populations. They have really poor detection, poor sensitivity, poor specificity for individuals who are outside the average range. They're also equally bad for folks who have a pre-existing learning disability or potentially a low education. Folks with hearing and vision problems, there's limited validity there. 
Also, some of our folks have limited hand function. They're definitely poor as standalone measures. You always want to have that informant or collateral input, and we always want to think about risk factors and context. So Joseph's MOCA score was a 25. That score is actually kind of right in that gray zone. Um, it's not a number that you can say you're just fine, um, but it's also really not terribly alarming. So what do we want to do? For Joseph, we uh, followed what's kind of my suggested action plan um, because I got to tell you, rarely are geriatric cases clear cut. Um, so even if, say, he had had a clear cut case of delirium, and we discovered its cause and we were able to undertake immediate and effective treatment, we still know that that's a risk factor for other things. And so we would want to follow these steps over time, over three months, over six months, maybe up to a year as much as possible. So step one is that rule out. Um, and then two is to monitor folks over time, again, using these frontline tools at each of these steps. And then sometimes, depending on what you find with your rule outs, with your monitoring, with your frontline tools, it might be time to uh, initiate a more in-depth evaluation. Um, if problems persist or, or worsen, um, you might want to consider whether they need a brain scan, perhaps an MRI, maybe additional labs, and to consult with specialists. So let me uh, wrap or push forward a little bit with Joseph here. Um, here's a reminder of those uh, background items. Uh, we were able to uh, say that delirium was not a fit for his presentation. Depression treatment, or I mentioned that was a positive screen. And when you talk to him more, it was clear that he really was feeling socially isolated and disconnected and depressed. So he was open to um, treatment um, and that was initiated. I would argue, though, that in his case, because his depression was not severe, that 26 or was it 25 out of 30 on the MOCA is still in the gray zone and that dementia is to be determined. He's in a high risk um, per, uh, group. He's a little young, uh, but it's definitely worth paying attention and following him over time. So. I have here um, a, a cartoon where there's this aging Superman standing at what looks to be the windowsill of a very tall building. And he says, dang, now where was I going? Now from this, is it dementia? Is it delirium? Is it depression? Hopefully at this point in my talk, while you may not from this simple thing of where was I going, be able to tell which one it is, I hope you're feeling a bit more confident um, in being able to ask the next questions, to initiate the workup, to use some frontline tools to try to figure it out. All right, thank you so much, everyone. It's so weird, of course, giving a talk where I can't see anyone. Um, I'm hoping that there are some questions. I purposefully left time here to be able to, to um, answer some. I believe the chat box is, is where people can. Yeah, the chat box is okay. open and um, I'm waiting for questions. Here's one. In terms of recognizing delirium, can a patient have different phases of hyperactive and hypoactive? or is it only one or the other? And um, this person said they asked because you underlined or. If a person has a history of delirium, will they have the same type next time? Well, gosh, that's awfully nice of you to ask this in such a good uh, format. You could have just chastised me. I, I should not have underlined or. It should have said and or. Um, many patients will exhibit both um, and it can fluctuate and definitely folks may exhibit one um, pattern one time and a different one the other. I do think um, that in my clinical experience, um, folks have had delirium episodes that start off fairly similarly, at least this is what their loved ones say. Um, although the hospital course can be very complicated. Um, but yes, thank you for, for that nudge. You really can see both in the same patient. You can see both in the same patient in the same day. Um, and you should not assume that just because someone has shown one type at one point that they would not show the other. Thank you for that. So Emily, if we use the MOCA, should we be using the newest version? This person said they're using, they're used to using 7.1 for years. 
Do you know, I just sat down earlier uh, this week, so I guess that was yesterday. I, it's hard to keep track of what day is what these days. Um, but I sat down yesterday and I put them side by side, the 7.1 and the 8.1. <laughs> the only difference I see, um, and this is in the original version, you know, the standard one, um, is that the new version, the 8.1, has the statement at the very bottom saying um, something to the effect of that you need to be trained. Um, and it's expected that you will be trained uh, to do, to administer it, to ensure accuracy. Um, I will say, um, importantly, a lot of the data that's been published um, has been on the quote-unquote original versions, um, but then again, I don't see changes. They've tweaked the wording a little bit for some of the instructions for administration, but in gen general, that standard version has really remained unchanged. At what time would you initiate treatment for dementia for the patient in the case? Oh, wow. So that's a great question. Um, and just to be clear, you know, I'm sure Dr. Gilkey covered this last week. There is no treatment for these, these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease. Um, and so the medications that are approved for dementia by the FDA are merely uh, designed to try to adjust for certain either brain chemical changes um, in that, say, for instance, in the case of like Aricept or Dinepazil is the generic name, it's trying to allow the brain to make better use of the acetylcholine it's still able to make because these acetylcholine neurons are dying. Um, so it doesn't in any way keep the neurons from dying. So eventually those medications can't help. Memantine um, is responding to the fact that there's some neurochemical uh, um, essentially excitotoxicity that's thought to occur in the more moderate to later stages of dementia. And this medication um, has been shown to kind of reduce that neurotoxicity, that um, extra excitatory activity that can be damaging. Uh, neither of these, none of these types of medications actually are treatment. So in Joseph's case, sorry, let me slide back to your real question. In Joseph's case, first of all, he really doesn't meet criteria at all for dementia. Um, he would need to decline further in his thinking abilities. There would need to be a clear link to loss of function in daily living. Even though he's not remembering his daughter's, co he's, his daughter's coming over, he is actually, um, for the first time in a while, taking care of like his own finances and having to procure his own food and things like that. So while he's not eating as well as he did when he was married, um, he is picking up new things uh, and, and carrying them out without too many slips. Um, so you'd really need to see that um, full set of criteria met for a dementia diagnosis. Then at that point, um, I think it's important also that his prescribing providers, I am not a prescriber, that they would fully consider what other medications he's on, the risk benefit profile of prescribing another medication um, and things of that nature. That was really long-winded. Sorry about that. <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with regard to the MOCA, um, how do you handle things with older adults who have hearing and or vision impairment? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. And of course, I'm, I'm with um, converting all of my clinical work right now to telemedicine, either, you know, via video or via telephone, I'm reminded more and more of just how important and how wonderful it is to have the opportunity to be in the same room with people. Um, it's challenging enough when someone has significant hearing loss or vision problems to do an evaluation when they're in the room. Um, it becomes much more limited via telephone or via um, video technology. What I would say is the most important thing is to just not mis misattribute areas of weakness from these cognitive, or sorry, from these sensory impairments or our situational impairments to their cognition. Um, so I, for instance, recently did a telephone evaluation and even did some testing and all the pieces are in place to diagnose an early stage dementia, but I'm not going to do it yet. <laughs> there is no benefit to the patient right now to throw a label on there. Um, 
In fact, there's a few different sort of behavioral changes that the patient can make. Um, and then when I wanna reevaluate them again and when I can do so in person, whether it's in three months or four months, whenever that may be, I can then do something that's more useful for the patient and not somehow make a, put a label on there that could be very detrimental. That doesn't mean, sorry, I also say though, that doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to try to provide care. We just have to really be thoughtful of all the caveats um, and the environmental situations that be coming into play. One thing that somebody brought up recently that I thought was so interesting is, you know, you can talk to someone on the telephone or via video call, but what you don't know is, is the room they're in uncomfortably cold? Um, you won't know they're in pain unless they tell you, and it's probably harder to read facial expressions. Are there uh, distractions? Like, is there something kind of burning in the background? Is, you know, someone put some toast in the toaster and burn it. We just really don't know what sort of distractions may be going on during our testing that could be influencing the scores. So it's all the constant with a grain of salt. Thanks so much for that. That's, um, <laughs> I hadn't really even thought about trying to do that all by telehealth. So here's yeah, another. And I, oh, sorry, I'll just jump in. I hope you don't mind me saying this. I um I've been using telehealth for a number of years um, to work with my veterans because so many live rurally, remotely, have barriers to travel to come into either the Seattle VA or the American Lake Division, um, and so for me. This is just a little extra difficulty <laughs> with doing evaluations um, in that these, I'm doing it with some patients who can't go to one of the rural clinics, I'm doing it to their home. Um, for someone who's never used these methods, try, you know, be kind to yourself. There's only so much you can bite off and try to learn on the fly all at once. Um, I think it's really important to take baby steps, um, think about what's most important for your patients uh, and gather what you can. So here's a question about how to convince a senior with pulmonary issues who's experiencing brain changes that oxygen could help, even though they are absolutely opposed to using it, um, concerns that delirium seems to be taking over. Oh my gosh. Well, that's, <laughs> thanks for asking me the impossible question. I want to, what, what would you do? Because I have, I have not had success um, with this pit. For the most part, if you can get them to use the oxygen or just try it for a little bit, they usually feel enough better <laughs> that, that they may be much more open to using it more often. Um, but kind of like with a CPAP machine for folks with severe sleep apnea, getting them to start is, is, the, is a very uphill battle. You are absolutely right. Um, I'd be really curious, actually, is there anyone in the audience who's had any luck with this particular situation, because it is so important. While anyone types in their thoughts, if they have them, I would say, I wonder if your patient, the patient that I can think of that was so resistant um, was someone who smoked. Um, and because they didn't want to blow them, you know, they didn't want to take a risk of, of, of having a serious accident, they were more wanting to keep smoking than to use oxygen. And finally, kind of a, a family intervention occurred, um, as well as um, basically some aggressive uh, smoking cessation um, treatments were initiated. Um, I actually don't know exactly how that case turned out. That was a few years ago. Well, shoot, nobody's jumped in with the, with the answer. <laughs> I was hoping someone would have it. Thank you for asking that question. These behavioral changes are always really challenging. Ah, so someone commented that outside of the VA, oxygen can be relatively expensive. Uh, I just wasn't really aware of that. I, I would have thought that that is something that's um, covered under Medicare um, or Medicaid as appropriate. Um, so that's really disappointing. I, I should, maybe that's one of my disclosures I should give at the beginning of the talk is that all of my clinical care does occur within the VA setting. And while a lot of times the VA gets some negative press, I'd like to say something that's really positive. I'm able to work with veterans and, 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 and work on their health care without constantly um, fretting um, about fi the financial impact uh, of what we're trying to do with them. 
Yeah, okay, I see the note here. So at least on Medicare, it's relatively expensive. When they only have Medicare only, sorry, no um, supplemental insurance, that's tough. So Emily, I don't have any other questions at this point. I'm wondering, you have it up on your slide, but if you wanna mention specifically how people can request copies of the 3Ds cards. Yes, thank you. What a good prompt also. The 3Ds contact card um, information is there. Um, normally, I would have some on hand with me in person to hand out to people that actually came in physically to, to the University of Washington. Um, and then um, we sometimes have mailed some out to different big sites. Um, but you can get your own. All you need to do is email Julie Moore at va.gov. It's right there. And uh, just say who you are, that you saw this talk, and that you're requesting. You know, we can handle orders that are larger, 50 to 100, or even just a few, if that's what you're interested in for your setting. Um, also, you know, a lot of times questions come up after the talk, um, or, or people are shy, um, and or the chat box doesn't seem to be working for you. So please feel free to email me. On this page here that's visible still is my VA email. Um, and then possibly easier to spell is my University of Washington email, which is just E-T-R-I-T-T, -T -T, so etrit at uw.edu. Um, I'm a little, um, I don't check with that one quite as frequently during the work week, but I have access to it at all times as well. Thanks for that. One other question. Since you've mentioned a little bit about sleep, are there noticeable differences in the sleep patterns among depression, delirium, and dementia? Oh, what a great question. I really haven't had that one before. Um, I think a challenge there is that sleep can be disrupted in all three. Um, and it's so individualized. One, how people report sleep and our ability to get good collateral information on it. Um, I find it's really common that um, my folks who have depression will report that they're only getting like three hours of sleep a night, right? They have trouble falling asleep, they can't stay asleep. If they wake up too early, they can't fall back asleep. Um, but I know that there's this reporting bias that occurs. Um, they're often saying they get less sleep than they are actually getting. Um, on the other hand, um, insomnia is a big problem, um, and uh, folks with dementia often have sort of that loss of the normal sleep-wake rhythms, um, and they can be awake and agitated more often at night, and unfortunately, it's really hard when someone has dementia to keep them from doing a bit more napping during the day. Having regularly scheduled activities and trying to keep them active will always help with sleep um, or should always help with sleep. Um, folks who are, delir who are delirious um, often have just completely thrown out all normal sleep-wake um, uh, cycles um, and, and really are often unaware of even what time of day it is. So I guess that's the best I can answer that. I don't know that there is such a, um, that there's a way to do such a crisp discrimination between the three syndromes for sleep. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have. So I I'll sort of echo another um, comment in the chat box from one of our attendees who said your lecture was fantastic. Oh. And thank you so much, Dr. Trichu. And I put the link for the evaluation into the chat for those of you um, who are looking at the chat. And so we'd appreciate that feedback. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care.